Hello, my name is Saeed Khan. I'm Professor of Near East and Asian Studies and Global Studies and Director of Global Studies at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan in the United States. 2022 marks the 75th anniversary of partition, one of the most traumatic and turbulent periods in human history and certainly within the history of the 20th century. Now, World War II ended in 1945 and the British recognized that they could no longer afford to hold on to much of their colonial empire. And as a result of this, India was finally set to gain its independence. The original date for uh, the independence of India was scheduled to be at the end of June of 1948. Prime Minister Clement Attlee dispatched Lord Mountbatten, one of the heroes of World War II, to be the last viceroy and representative of King George VI, the King Emperor of the British Empire, to preside over and facilitate the end of British rule, something that had been in India in some way, shape, or form for over 200 years. Well, as you can imagine, the task was not going to be an easy one. Uh, there were a lot of logistics that needed to happen. There needed to be a lot of handovers of responsibilities and administrative tasks. At the same time, India had been facing an increase in communal violence among many of the various groups in the country including Muslims, Sikhs, and Hindus. The issue got to the point where a partition was now being proposed to split off the majority Muslim provinces of India into a separate country, Pakistan, with the remainder of India being independent on its own. This led to a lot of communal violence even before independence was granted for August of 1947. Well, in preparation of the uh, independence of India, Sir Cyril Radcliffe was brought in to then create the boundaries of what would be now the new country of India and the new country of Pakistan. The problem was Radcliffe himself had near to no familiarity or experience with India, in fact, had never even visited India. And yet he was tasked to go ahead and divide an area that included 400 million people. As a result of it, as one can imagine, not everyone was going to be happy. And given the geography of India, and given where the majority Muslim populations lay, it meant the division of provinces themselves. So the Punjab and Sindh were split in half on the western side of India, and the Bengal was split in half on the eastern side of India. And Pakistan was formed as a country on two sides with a hostile country in the middle. The provinces of the Northwest Frontier Province, half of Punjab, half of Sindh and Balochistan, and then half of the Bengal created the new country of Pakistan. What this meant was a sense of fear and a sense of foreboding for those religious communities which felt that their days were numbered in one country or the other. When finally independence is granted to Pakistan, it is August the 14th of 1947. The very next day, August the 15th, is Independence Day for India. But this wasn't a moment of celebration for everybody. And in fact, it marked the beginning of a rather brutal dislocation of millions upon millions of people. And it was a rather bloody process as well. Millions lost their lives in violence in villages, either as they were uh, being evicted or forced to evacuate because the conditions had now grown to be so perilous. People who were neighbors one day now found themselves to be enemies of each other the very next. And we find that along with millions of people who lost their lives, tens of millions of people were dislocated. Generally speaking, Hindus and Sikhs migrated to India and Muslims migrated the other direction toward Pakistan to the point where there was even violence among the uh, people who were passing each other in the process. The animosity that exists to this day between India and Pakistan is in many ways a legacy of what happened during the time of partition. And if you think about it, the trauma is also based on the idea that from one landmass, India, we now have various countries that were formed. Pakistan itself would split in half 24 years later when the new country of Bangladesh 
was founded out of East Pakistan. But all of these countries were the product of lines on a map, as well as their identity of the various community members. What makes somebody a Pakistani and somebody an Indian has to do with which side of the boundary they reside in. And it was a boundary that was drawn by Sir, uh, Cyril Radcliffe, uh, a British bureaucrat who, again, had very little experience with the, uh, the territory itself. Now, the idea of independence, uh, which, of course, is closely related to partition, was a process which began decades earlier. The Quit India movement, uh, from which, as many people are familiar, gives us the names of Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru and Muhammad Ali Jinnah and Sardar Patel, were not the only people involved in suing for independence from Britain. Movies like Gandhi in 1982 certainly immortalized many of these figures, and their significance, of course, is not disputed. But many others played a very important role in the independence of India. And some of these individuals were not necessarily beholden to diplomacy or negotiation. Take, for example, Bhagat Singh, a 23-year-old young man who, along with others, conspired to reject and revolt against British rule in India in 1930. They plotted to and were successful in murdering a British officer. Unfortunately, it was a matter of mistaken identity. The person that was their target uh, was not killed. But the conspiracy to go ahead and murder a British official then led to the arrest, the trial, the conviction, and the sentencing of Bhagat Singh. And in fact, Bhagat Singh was then executed in 1931 at a very, very young age. Now, Bhagat Singh has been an individual who has largely been erased from the history of the independence movement of India. Recently, though, we find that Bhagat Singh's name is starting to emerge and he is taking his place within the Indian narrative of independence history as a folk hero and as a martyr. And what's interesting about this is that as we lead up to partition and the entire journey of getting there, there are new voices that are emerging when it comes to a fuller picture of how the independence movement occurred and how partition also happened. Violence was also part of the process, although again, those who were beholden to a more diplomatic approach tend to get more visibility and tend to be remembered more not only by uh, India itself, but also by the British uh, colonial project. Now, if we take a look at the development of partition and what its legacy is today, we are in the midst of a generation which is starting to leave. As people pass away who were involved and have firsthand knowledge of being witnesses to or who face the trauma of partition themselves, it's very important to go ahead and chronicle the stories as these are firsthand witnesses and accounts of what happened at the time of partition. Those who remember having to make the dislocating journey from one side of the border to the other, those who had family members who were killed, those who left family members behind uh, in the former country, perhaps never to see them again, are all parts of a history that needs to be told, needs to be highlighted, and needs to be reconciled. Today, sadly, Partition is not a part of a curriculum that one finds in many schools. Perhaps it is seen as a dark period. Perhaps it is seen as a period of shame. In fact, Winston Churchill called partition the shameful flight. So as a result of these kinds of traumas, in order to get a better understanding of history, a better understanding of people as an identity, it is incumbent to go ahead and teach not only as a legacy to those who perished and those who were dislocated, not only for those people who were directly affected by partition, but those also recognizing that partition is not just a moment of Indian history, it is also a moment in British history.